um, under that item. If not, yeah, it, it might be useful um, just just for me to update the, the meeting on on where we are with the bus service improvement plan um, because we 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 had the informal joint uh, consultation subcommittee um, in, on the twenty sixth of August. Um, we're working to a, a deadline uh, set by government to submit the bus service improvement plan by the end of this month. Um, so uh, we, um, we've been through an engagement process of which that meeting was, was part of that. Uh, we're in the process of, of finalising the document. Um, at the moment, it, it, uh, uh, the approval to submit it will go to the combined authority next week. Um, and then we will be able to, um, to publish the, the document early in November. It, it's a bidding document as well as a plan for the future. So um, we, we are keeping it relatively under wraps um, until such time as we've submitted it, because um, obviously we, we want to get the uh, best outcome from the, the, the government's bidding process. So we will publish the yeah, outcome of the service improvement plan in the first week of November. OK, thank you, Dave. Um, any questions? No, I notice introductions is next on the list. Never usually find it on agenda as seventh item, um, but as most people have got their names, uh, their names up on on Zoom, I think we, we we can skip that point. But when we do get onto transport updates or when you do speak, it it, it might be best just to explain where you're from and what post you hold, um, just to assist. But we won't do a round robin now. Um, they do have a, a, an extra slow creep on Zoom compared to what they do in real life when you're slowly going around a circle. Uh, in a room, so we'll we'll move ahead from that uh, and move on to the update and transport review. Um, Dave, um, can I bring you in on the transport review? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, and um, we uh, we we use this lot and this in this meeting just to update uh, members of the of the district consultation committee on on, on sort of live transport issues. Um, we, um, we we put a link into the transport committee papers for that uh, of the last transport committee. So um, that's a sort of detailed update um, in terms of, of where we are. Um, if I, I'll, I'll just, before I get into any sort of Calderdale detailed uh, elements, um, j just a few points really, just, just as to uh, as to where things, where things sit. I think I mentioned earlier the, the bus service improvement plan is something which we, we we're actively um, working on now in terms of the uh, submission to government um, and that's part of a process uh, of, of adopting a bus service improvement plan and then establishing the delivery mechanism for that through through a, an enhanced partnership between the combined authority and, and bus operators and district councils uh, and so we we will um, move into the process of establishing that combined that a, a enhanced partnership ahead of the uh, the deadline, which we're we're working to on the first of April, April to do that. So, um, so that's that's, that's part of a process. We we simultaneously uh, are looking at the business case for uh, adopting franchising powers as per the, the Bus Services Act um, and the um, the uh, combined authority members and the mayor uh, approved back in June that we would develop an enhanced partnership with the bus operators, but um, we will al also do an assessment of the need for a franchising scheme at the same time. So both those pieces of work are in progress. Um, and I think the critical thing for us to do is to uh, is to move towards um, the uh, establishing the uh, enhanced partnership, uh, getting approval and, uh, and get, hopefully getting funding for the first phase of uh, a, an ambitious program of, of bus service improvements, uh, which I think we, uh, we, we much of, of what's in there is is it would be welcome generally. I think the other thing I would just sort of say, in a matter of context on on bus issues, um, is uh, is that you know, we are still uh, working out of the significant financial impact that the pandemic's had on public transport, um, and so we we're still in a regime of, uh, of what one might term emergency funding, both from the government and from, from the combined authority in terms of, of supporting that. Um, bus operators, I'm sure will, will update their, their, their views and positions shortly. Um, but I think over across the whole region, we're seeing uh, bus services 
not quite at three quarters of, of the sort of numbers of people that they were carrying this time two years ago. Um, so there's still a, um, a, a gap in, in people traveling and therefore a gap in the, um, in the um, cash flow, as it were, to, into the, the, the public transport network and, and similarly on rail as well. Um, on rail, um, we, we're, um, we're awaiting the publication, uh, long awaited publication of the government's plan um, on uh, the integrated rail plan, um, uh, for, for the, which, which is particularly looking at the northern region. Um, and we expect to, to, to see something of that um, around the spending review announcements, which are expected at the end of this month. Um, and so that the sort of critical in sort of direction of travel in terms of investment in, in rail in, in the north of England. And we um, we were aware of that and you know, there's, there's been quite a, a lot of, uh, of media speculation, but, um, but that's broadly where it is. The, the combined authority is, is developing and revising its rail strategy alongside of that. Um, and uh, we will go to the transport committee in uh, on the, the 5th of November with a, with a further update as to as to where both the, those things are, are getting to um, so that we can develop a, a, a vision for rail going forward. So those are the big picture elements. Um, getting into some uh, sort of local issues around Calderdale, we, we, we provide you with, uh, in this report, uh, a list of the live schemes that, that we have. I guess the, um, the one that, uh, that jumps out in particular is that we've now started work on Halifax bus station um, the services have, have been um, displaced partially into the town centre um, uh, and to, to enable the space to be able to um, redevelop and, and build the new bus station. Um, so that, that's, that, that process has started um, and so hopefully we'll, we'll see some great benefits coming out of that. Um, but the, but a, a, a period of, of a little disruption to, along the way to get to that. Um, so I'll stop there. Um, happy to take any questions that people have got. Thank you, Dave. I'm not oh, there. I've got John. Go ahead, John. Yeah, thank you, Dave. I've, I've watched the uh, edited highlights, as it were, of the meeting a couple of weeks ago where I saw your statement. And I noted what you said about uh, if there had to be cuts because of staffing issues which are ongoing for most of the companies at the moment, then they should be on frequent services rather than infrequent services. Obviously, that was a big if because we would all prefer there to be no cuts whatsoever. Um, I'd like to welcome Alex, Alex Hornby. Good to see you, Alex. Alex uh, did reply to my recent letter. Unfortunately, the uh, service to which I referred, the 563, whose stop I can see from my window, is nowhere near what it's advertised. It's advertised as once per hour. It's been running as once every two hours ever since Transdave took it over. And I know that Transdave has taken a very wise move to get rid of most of uh, Yorkshire's uh, old and chronic buses. The only problem is, of course, that going up the hill at uh, just below walking speed was better than not going up the hill at all. So uh, quite a lot of people have stopped using that 563. As I say, I can see out of my window where there used to be on the half past nine, for example, seven regulars. There are now no regulars because they've all eventually learned that that bus just never turns up. Um, and this is very unfortunate. Uh, I don't know whether Dave's definition of regular services includes once every two hours or once every one hour. And personally, given the sort of levels of patronage which that bus had admittedly before the um, pandemic, we were, I was thinking, perhaps we is exaggerating, but I was thinking, oh, we could do with twice as many buses on this route for the number of passengers it takes. And now it's looking as if we couldn't do with any buses at all. So I hope that as soon as possible, we get that back onto a regular service so that I can tell people, yes, it is running and yes, it will come. As long as they feel that it won't come, obviously they're not gonna queue up in the wind and the rain uh, in the hope that it might. So that's on the regularity of services. 
as far as the passenger numbers are concerned, given that exception or exceptions like this, are very pleased in recent times to be on some services where the buses are almost full. I'm thinking in particular of the ones which are run at a subsidised level by South Pennine uh, Community Transport. I was on the bus over to Glossop at the weekend, um, the bus which goes from Halifax to Homeford, you might think an unlikely route, and yet they're full up. Um, it shows that there is the potential for using buses, never mind pandemics. And indeed, Alex, in his post about the services around Huddersfield, has quite rightly boasted about the numbers who are now using those improved services, even including an extra service. And we're very jealous, or I'm very jealous in Collardale, at looking at an extra service in Kirklees when we aren't managing what we're promised in Collardale. So, Good luck, Transdave. I hope you get back to what you deservedly suppose on all your other operations roundabout to which we used. And let's hope that things improve very quickly. Okay, thank you. Chair, should I start with that? And perhaps Alex might want to add as well. Um, yeah, I, I, I think there's a, there, are, there are a number of related issues, I think, that uh, that, that the bus industry in its wider sense and, and, and transport authorities like the combined authority are grappling with at the moment. Um, uh, one, uh, as, as we pointed out, is, is the fact that you know, passenger numbers are recovering, but the travel patterns are different. And um, uh, and it's quite an interesting observation that John has actually, and we've seen this through the, the data analysis we've done as well, and is, is that the bus use on weekends and, and for for what could be broadly termed pleasure trips is is is, is, is holding up quite well um, and some commuter journeys less so because of uh, of people's different working travel habits so so there's the impact of the pandemic there's also issues and i'm sure operator colleagues will will expand on this as well and, and as, as mr shepherd uh, points out i um, updated the transport committee at the last committee um is that the um the uh, there's a, a, a an issue around the availability of bus drivers nationally, um, as uh, as there is with uh, with heavy goods vehicle drivers as well, and this is impacting on service levels. Um, and so the, um, the the point that Mr. Shepherd makes is that you know, where possible to try and minimise the impact on on passengers by by if buses have to be taken out then they're better taken out on, on, on more frequent routes where they are available. And I think that's the, that's the challenge, particularly in somewhere like Calderdale in fairness, is that um, whilst that might be an option um, for, for operators in, in the larger towns and cities, it's, it's less of an option in the rural areas and less of an option where, where, where routes are, are half hourly or, or even less frequently. So, so absolutely get that. Try to prioritise the and, and minimise and min, minimise the impact as much as possible. But um, but the, you know, there are other other impacts. I think further, I, I'll I'll let Alex come in on this one. I think you know, there are um, there are some particular local challenges as well, which I think uh, he and colleagues are working through. Um, which uh, which I think we in with the support of the combined authority, uh, recognising some of the issues being faced um you know, they, these are difficult times in lots of senses so i don't know alex you want to you want to come in there thank you dave um thank you john and thank you chair and everyone else mm -hmm. and um, um good afternoon to everyone um chair would it be possible because to help explain my response um i've produced a very short slide deck would it be would now be an appropriate time to share that yeah, that Please. sounds good. That's very well prepared for a question. I like it. Okay. Thank you. you for coming, didn't you? <laughs> ben, would you would you do you want to share it or do you want me to? I can load it up. Uh, two oh, seconds. Okay. Thank you, Ben. No worries. Just um, share my screen. Okay, so while, while that's happening, folks, just to introduce myself. So I'm, I'm Alex. I'm the um, Alex Holmby, the CEO at Transdev Blaisfield. 
So we're we're the new owners of Yorkshire Tiger, um, and I believe whilst this is I think my first time at, at this at this session, I have been represented by by other colleagues here uh, previously while we were progressing the the acquisition. Um, and thanks in particular, John, for being understanding. I think in terms of some of the services that that we are delivering at the moment. Um, in, in some ways, we we don't we don't deserve that level of understanding, but um, I, but I'll explain why. Because there's plenty of answers and reasons, um, but the solutions aren't so easy. But the solutions are coming and they're happening. So um, so obviously we, we acquired Yorkshire Tiger from Arriva in July, and we've set set upon quite a big transformation exercise. Um, we feel very bullish and confident that there's a strong future for buses in West Yorkshire, and particularly in the Calderdale and, and indeed the Kirklees areas um, where we believe that there is a role for, for, our, um, for our quality offering and um, very proud of the relationship we have with the combined authority and the work we've, we've done with them in other parts of West Yorkshire and there's no reason why we can't do the same here. Um, on the next slide, um, this is what was happening on, on, on day one um, in terms of um, the acquisition. So um, six buses were replaced on day one. A further six brand new buses were ordered um, after us reviewing the condition of the fleet and the transformations exercise we wanted to um, that we wanted to initiate at Yorkshire Tiger. So for everyone else's benefit, there's two depots essentially. There's one at Elland, which serves the Calderdale area, another at Waterloo that generally serves the Kirk Kirklees area. There's around 50 buses broadly split um, between the two depots, um, and we run a mixture of. Um, commercial work but majority in Ireland is actually tendered work on behalf of the combined authority there are typically low frequency routes um from day one we were quite to make it clear that we'd arrived although we knew that there was there was some work to do to get to the standard where we wanted to so a new customer app was introduced so people could track their buses in real time people could buy mobile tickets um and so on which is an extension of our successful um transdev go app all the drivers issued a brand new uniform because they were in a bit of a, a ragbag state. So everyone got issued a new uniform on day one. We had a one-to-one -one consultation with every colleague where we went through our plans and proposals and indeed learnt more from their ideas as well. So that was that was a really beneficial exercise for us and our team. Um, and as well as having a brand new website, we started to reintroduce paper timetables that we produced ourselves because we know customers like them. It's not always about getting the information on apps and online. It's about giving people paper timetables they can keep, particularly, um, not to be fair, not just older users, but, but new users. They prefer something that they can look at, plan, a bit like a restaurant menu sort of thing, thing things like that always work better in hand that you can study, understand, and then you use an app then day to day to make sure your bus is on time and so on. And we, we relaunched all the social media channels and customer contact point strength and, I think the particular reason I mentioned that is that the one thing I'd like to believe, um, well, I do believe that no matter um, the condition of the service is, we won't shy or hide away from everyone. And indeed, as John mentions, we've been in communication. I've been in communication with the councillors. I've been proactively communicating with the MP to let her know um, where things are. Um, you know, we won't we won't hide away from 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 any from any difficulties. And indeed. As Dave mentioned, um, we've been clear with the combined authorities to, as to where we are at the moment. So on the next slide, if we look at the current issues affecting the operation. So first of all, the fleet, um, you know, we're really keen we get the fleet up to, to our standards. That, that wasn't the case um, on, on day one. And to, but to be fair to Arriva, they have begun to help us out with some loan vehicles. But some of the vehicles just were in, were in no condition to operate, and we took the view that that we 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 weren't in a comfortable position to operate some of them. So that led to some um, some cancellations that we didn't expect. Um, indeed, as we tried to deal with some of those issues, the supply chain is affected. Um, Brexit, COVID induced delays, but it it is affecting the international supply chains for vehicle parts. Um, as we've discussed before, then we've had a national driver shortage, um, which is affecting us and everybody else. Um, all the engineers um, left um, and went to Arriva um, very quickly, but we think this is actually an opportunity because I think it needed a, a fresh, fresh broom. Um, and the issue, particularly at Calderdale, is we we weren't we weren't left with with the right number of small vehicles in order, in order to operate them. You need you need a certain number and you need a certain number of spares so you could confidently operate them each day. Sixteen of the twenty-three workings from Ellen Depot into Calderdale rely on small nine-meter buses, and you cannot use any other vehicles for those routes. And guess what? There was also, also always all, uh, guess what? There was also a shortage off across the country small nine-meter buses that we couldn't get hold of from absolutely anywhere. 
Um, also, there's a lack of MOT slots, so there's a national backlog of tests. So when we were getting vehicles in, in a good condition, we then couldn't get them to do an MOT test because there was a backlog of, of MOT tests. And indeed, the new buses that we ordered that we had here in September have been delayed until uh, the end of October for, for supply issues. So all in all, um, not great timing to, uh, to, to acquire a new bus company. Um, these, these are the issues that we faced. But um, we've dusted ourselves down and we're carrying on. If we look at the next slide, you see the kind of things that we're doing. So I think the first thing is, as I mentioned before, we've been very open about uh, where we stand with everyone, um, with the combined authority, with local decision makers and stakeholders. And indeed, um, myself, I'm, I'm available to talk on that. I should note as well, sorry, which is meant to begin, from Paul Taylor, our commercial director, is also on the call as well. And Paul's particularly good at handling the more tricky questions that because he's got a bigger brain than me. So if you've got any tricky questions, um, let's see how we get on with that later. Um, and also as well, in case um, I need to um, leave for, 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 for the Mers round table, driver short, so Paul will stay, Paul will stay on the line if there's any further questions beyond time. Um, so anyway, um, vehicles on loan, we, we put six vehicles from our own fleet in. And as I say, Arriva have helped us out in, in terms of loan so another another six that, that, are, that are arriving. Um, I think one thing that particularly help in terms of the driver shortage is we had our first set of wage negotiations. They understand we're the first in three years with the drivers. So obviously that will help retention, we believe, um, and we're hopeful that we'll we'll get to an agreement with that quite quickly. Those negotiations, those negotiations in our belief went quite positively. Um, and obviously we're advancing recruitment as soon as we hopefully get that wage deal arranged, we can start to advertise at that rate and hopefully that'll attract some new people in the industry and as I say, retain retain those that, 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 that may have been considering leaving. The six new Mercedes buses will arrive at the end of October and they will, will be focused on um, um, low frequency wicker contracted um, routes in Calderdale. Um, they're the first new buses um, I think Calderdale will have in, in, in about six years. They'll all be low emission to a high spec. Um, and I'll show you some images at the end so I can prove to you they exist. Um, we've employed some engineering contractors in the business on a temporary measure to help us get us through the, the shortage of engineering labour that we had. Um, a new engineering manager starts uh, next Monday and we've already appointed a new supervisor role into Ellen Depot to help us get through some of these engineering issues. Arriva also are assisting us in terms of putting our vehicles into their MOT slots to help us through that. And we've also redistributed some of the service work between Allen and Waterloo depots because Waterloo has begun to recover a lot quicker than Allen has. So we're beginning to put certain routes into, into Waterloo, the 343 in particular, to help Allen out. And we've also reached out to South Pennine Community Transport, um, good operator, doing good things. We'd already approached them before the takeover to do some level of partnership work and ticket availability and a few other things to help network provision. Um, and they've stepped in to help us on, on two, two routes under uh, with, with, upon the agreement of, of Wicker also. And the key thing is we have tried to prioritise low frequency routes. Um, John's right, um, that's what you do as opposed to high frequency routes. The only problem here at Team Pennine, and particularly Allen Depot, there are no high frequency routes. So it's quite difficult to, to, um, to, 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 to prioritise that. If we did have high frequency routes, I'm absolutely with John, that, that's what we do. Uh, but in this situation, it's, it's, it's a lot more difficult. Um, okay, then target, where we, where we then are expecting to be. Uh, I think first things first, it's worthwhile pointing out that irrespective of the, the issues we've had, we've got 100% track record on delivering um, kids to school on the school bus contracts that are, that are new to the depot. Um, we will be at a point by mid-October that one in two buses that we inherited will be replaced or refurbished to our Transdev high spec and the new team panel identity. That is new seating, generally with free Wi-Fi, next stop information, audio and visual inside, uh, inside the vehicle's customers, um, and USB power, the kind of things that people come rightly should come to expect on buses now. 30% of the vehicles used will be low emission Euro 6. Pre-Tokeover, that was zero. So again, there's been advancements in the, in the past four months in terms of what we're doing to help um, and deal with carbon emissions. As I mentioned, you know, these are the first new buses that we've seen in Colesdale in, in six years. So hopefully when they arrive, you know, that, that is a, hopefully a bit of a cause of celebration. We hope that we'll be returned to, to, to full staffing in terms of our drivers within three months. As I say, once we get through the, the wage negotiation, those other things, hopefully we'll get there then. Um, 
sorry, there isn't a target that would have an injury labour exodus. That's my fault for that being in there. So everybody ignore that. Um, and in terms of the bus models as well, is redistributing the bus models so we get over this situation of um, of of um, of having the right size bus for the right size route. There will also be a new customer contact centre open at Elland that we are recruiting for now. We are completely refurbishing the depot at Elland. There will be a new academy and training centre for all colleagues, and there will be a customer contact centre based there as well. So, and that will be staffed seven days a week so people can get a hold of us um, at, 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 at any time of day there. And I think, you know, the kind of targets that we're used to, and quite rightly, our colleagues at the Combined Authority are used to us serving are those kind of numbers, 99.6%, all over 99%, or, or all, the, all, all the depots, and indeed, we're already there at Huddersfield, and that's where we want to get to at once we get over those issues. And finally, um, these are the new Mercedes buses in build. Uh, they're being built in the north of England. Um, they were shipped over from Mercedes factory in um, from uh, from Mannheim. They're taken to Scarborough where they're converted to a low floor frame and then they're taken to Rochdale for the body to be built. So a bit German, but actually a lot northern as well. So um, and you'll see the for minibuses, minibuses are quite different to the minibuses that started the minibus revolution back in 1987. These aren't bread fans. These are nice, comfortable buses. Um, and again, fitted to a high specification with full audio, visual, next stop information, and so on and so forth. So I apologize for some of the issues that our customers are facing. It's not the standard we're used to, but as you can see, there are a number of challenges that we've had. And I'm hopeful that in the next few weeks, um, and maybe month or so, um, we should be over the worst. But certainly thank you for the patience and support that, that you're showing us. Thank you. Alex, thank you for that presentation, and it was uh, it was very informative, actually. And I'm sure that uh, a number of members in Calderdale Council have contacted me recently about them, so it's useful to have that information to pass back. And to any other operator who wants to bring something similar at future, please feel please feel free. Um, in terms of getting uh, the situation in Calderdale up to the sort of standards you usually expect, do you have a timeline of when you think that that might be uh, arrived at? So I think the um, I think we can expect that by um, by mid November there should be quite a significant change. As I say the six new buses should be in service then, and I think that will be the next major turning point. And during that time between then and now, as I say, I'm hoping that we'll we'll have dealt with some of the the, the, the bigger driver shortage issues. Indeed, we were facing similar at Waterloo that we've overcome in the last few, last four weeks, and there's no reason why that time scale isn't is shouldn't be similar here. But as I say, I'm more than happy to carry on providing proactive updates so, so, so you're all aware of where we stand. Thank you for that and welcome to the committee as well. John, do you feel that that's covered you in terms of your question? appreciate uh, that there's the, the sad loss of your regulars that are there, but hopefully um, to be turned around in mid-November, it might draw some of them back. Yes, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Alex. Um, a very full answer to my question. I'm flattered, of course. Um, no, all I can say is I hope you manage to keep up and uh, provide what you're promising. I know there are lots of problems in the way. Um, unfortunately, many of your customers don't appreciate the difficulties that you're under, and it's very difficult to reassure them uh, when there isn't the bus there, which is basically what they're wanting. But thank you anyway. And I've just picked up a question from Richard in the chat about um, linking in with Calderdale College for employment opportunities. Is there anything you could you could share on that, Alex, in terms of how you link in locally? Um, well, I think at the moment we're we're currently running the network that that, that we're operating, but we're, we're trying to see what new opportunities there are to to again complement the other operators network and, and again work together to try and provide a comprehensive network rather than trying to work against each other so i think any any opportunities for new routes again we're we're all ears and and we're really keen to see what else we can do to strengthen the bus network as opposed to overlay it which i don't think is really in anyone's interest at the moment so okay um I think we'll leave that point then. There, then, if we're uh, if we're happy, it's been covered for now, and hopefully the next time we're sat here in this meeting, everything will be roses and sunshine. I'm sure. 
Um, well, maybe not the weather actually, because we'll be deep in we'll be deep in winter, won't we? Um, by then, um, a couple of points I was going to raise under the chairs update. Um, one, um, and it's not something I can really give much further detail on, is that the transport committee, its operations, and subsequently this committee is still under review. Um, I understand no changes will take effect uh, within this uh, within this municipal year, which is the year running to May. So I presume any changes. Um, that will be brought forward or will take effect after then. And hopefully in between now and then, we should be able to give some more update as to as to what that's going to mean and how we can make everything we do more uh, meaningful uh, and valuable to, to us and to the members of the public. Um, I think in the long run, we've, want, we've, we've wanted to encourage more members of the public to tap into uh, what we do. Um, and I'm hopeful that any outcome will allow us to do that a lot better. Um, the other I was going to raise, and please, Dave, jump in and stop me if it is somewhere else on the agenda, um, but it was demand responsive transport. And um, at the lunch, last transport committee, we got to see uh, one of the buses that first is putting out in East Leeds under the demand responsive transport scheme. Um, the reason I raise it for us is I understand we might be next in line. Um, but at the very least, it's something um, that I think is very important to Calderdale. Uh, it gives an opportunity to show that this sort of technology could work in a rural area. Um, in a nutshell, and Dave might be able to tell me about uh, a bit more specifically about what, what's been committed to in East Leeds, but that you um, effectively hail a, a bus via an app and it will come. Uh, is it as near as your street corner? Um, go on, Dave, I'll let you... I'll let yes, you yeah, then. OK. Um, yes, um, we... We launched two or three weeks ago um, in East Leeds uh, a flexible service, which is, as the chair says, the demand responsive service. The, the customer books a journey in uh, using an app. Um, it, we, we sort of say it's from the street corner to, to the destination effectively. It's not a door-to-door -door service, but it, it, will, um, it, it, it will sort of take people most of the way. Um, and, uh, and obviously in a, in a minibus that could be shared with other people that's traveling at the same time. Um, and so we, we launched that service. We've been able to fund it in East Leeds uh, through a combination of, of the, uh, the government's uh, grant of funding to Leeds and the Leeds Public Transport Investment Programme, which, um, which is, is, a, is a sort of unique funding stream to the city that, that, that emanates originally from uh, the um, the the the, the trolleybus new generation transport scheme which didn't go ahead and, and government uh, uh, sought to honour its uh, commitments to uh, to the city and, and made funding available and we've used some of that funding for, for East Leeds. The other reason why we've used East Leeds as a starting point for, for demand responsive transport is that um, there's a lot of new housing growth in that area and we've captured section 106 uh, developer funding to to help fund it as well and and we we the east leeds one in particular is is aimed firstly at at the new housing secondly at the fact there's quite a lot of dispersed employment um in that part of the city uh that, that isn't particularly well served by bus services because it's essentially industrial estates are either side of the river so um so uh, that's a, that's a starting point we submit our bus service improvement plan um uh uh, which will be seeking funding for rolling uh, this, a similar types of service out into other areas. And we've started discussions with, with, with Calderdale members and officers uh, with a view to, to looking at how such a service can supplement what, what the bus service in Calderdale actually, actually offers as well, um, particularly to, to more sparsely populated areas. So we are, we are looking at, um, uh, at Calderdale's potential area that, uh, the demand responsive transport might might play a role and to a certain extent that there's an element of uh, of of trialing going on with with it um in, in, in and to see how customers respond to to that as a um a, 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 as a as an option um what we don't want to do is destabilize existing bus services along the way um we want to create new journey opportunities uh, for, for people so we will be careful in the sense that what well, we, we don't do sweep existing bus services out of the way, put something in, and then and then uh, and then find that that's not actually what people in the area want. So we'll we'll do some fairly careful discussions with with, with Calderdale members and officers and, and, and further consultations before we um, before we, we launch something and get it 
um, up and running. Um, and to the chair's previous point about the transport committee review, um, and thanks to, to a, uh, a couple of people from from the district's subcon uh, sub uh, consultation subcommittees um, who who have written to me um, following the invite for, for any feedback, which which we'll take on board um, and feed into the into a review, which will be presented to the combined authority meeting in early December. Uh, and as the chair says, um, any changes that come about um, from the constitution of the main transport committee and the uh, associate subcommittees will happen from May next year. Thank you, Dave. And uh, whilst, whilst Calderdale isn't quite next on the list in terms of the fact that we're still waiting to secure the funding, um, <laughs> I'll, I'll keep pushing on this one. I think it could be an interesting and exciting opportunity for Calderdale. Oh, yes. And, and, uh, and you know, I think we... we and we do absolutely want to engage with the Coldale uh, people to um, to to um, to identify what it, how we, how we can do something in the space. Yeah. And uh, just like I think uh, certain um, taxi-based apps have been very disruptive to the system, I think if we, on a public and community basis, can collectively plan and manage any disruption that is inevitably going to come through technology and be on the front foot with it, I think we'll uh, we'll be served a lot better. Um, than, than has happened in other sectors. Yeah, so one of the things we have done with it, the the Flexibus and would do in other areas is we're, we're, we're growing it out of the Access Bus service. So the Access Bus team look after it in, uh, and they um, and and we, we share the technology that they use as well. Um, but there is, there is a human being at the other end. It's not completely app-driven as well. That's good. Good to know there's still space for humans. Right. I'll take us on to the information report. Um, a couple of these have been uh, uh, touched on, um, but I would draw everyone's attention to the uh, appendices on this report as well, which gives a list of schemes um, at various stages um, in their life. So if people have anything they want to comment um, on the report or on the, uh, the list of projects, um, of which there are quite a few, um, I'll take any I'll take any members or operators who want to who want to raise a question. No, Dave, would you like to add anything to the information report? I think you might be having a quick chat. Sorry, I was on mute. You're don't worry. Um, no, I, 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 I've, I've been to, to the Calderville uh, subcommittee many years. Uh, we normally talk about Allen Railway Station. So um, as you'll see from the report, a, a, a planning application is in. So um, it's nice to see some progress on with, with that as well. So i um, happy to take questions, Jeff. Anyone got any questions? No, I was just going to flag up about the bus station. I know you mentioned it earlier, Dave. It's a fantastic piece of news. It's good to see it. Uh, it's good to see it progressing. Um, do you know when we might be welcoming welcoming people into our new bus station? Um, I, yeah, I, I, off the top of my head, I think late next year um, is, uh, is is where we probably expect it to be. I think one of the things I, 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 I would say is in the fact that we've closed the bus station partly and, and moving the buses out into the town, um, we've uh, we've we've we tried to signpost people to the right bus stops. Um, we're doing some more communications around that um, in the local papers. Uh, we have had a little bit of feedback that says um, it's a bit confusing, um, and I guess you know, these things can be. Um, but hopefully, if, you know, if anybody's got any particular issues that that comes from having done that and if they feedback that back to us we can we can look to see what we can do it's um it, it can be challenging for uh, for people uh, particularly uh, people who uh who, who are used to catching their bus in the in the um the space of the bus station to uh, to queue up on the street can sometimes be a, bit, a little bit of an inconvenience particularly people with, with less mobility but um yeah we'll we'll if there's any issues that emerge we'll deal with them Thank you, Dave. And to say that it's such a big project and has obviously caused some disruption that you've had to manage, I've not received 
any any complaints or concerns. I think overall it has been it has been very well managed. Okay. And uh, I mean, I mean, as a North Halifax resident, I've been used to getting my bus from the town centre all my life, yes. as we often <laughs> have. Um, yeah. But a lot of excitement in the town and uh, while some disruption frustrates when people see that it's for something worthwhile people are willing to bear um, yes. cost of inconvenience yes. okay I've got I think John. Paul, Tur Paul Turner has his hand up oh and, uh, yeah I just wanted to um, you, Paul, just make a point make a point about the bus station and um, I, I think it's perhaps just worth us acknowledging the the work um colleagues at, at, at Wicca and, um, and, and the council did to, to plan all this. Um, we, we turned up as a bit Johnny come lately, sort of 11th hour into the process and, and tweaked a few bits, but actually it was clear that um, there was a, a, an immense amount of, um, of, of planning went in to, to minimise that. And I think, Joe, if, if you're not inundated with uh, feedback about it, that's probably because it was, it, it seems to be well, fairly well planned. So I think it's just important um, as operators, we 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 acknowledge that. Um, yeah, that. Doubtlessly, there'll be teething problems and things that tweak over time. But yeah, having that engagement was was really really welcome. Thank you. I've got I've got I've got John and I've got Jane. I'll let John come in first. Jane, I'll come to you. I think there's nothing whatsoever to be done about it. But I would just comment that having to walk across town from one bus to another emphasizes what a great thing it is to have all the buses in one bus station all at the same time. It's easy if you miss the bus or it doesn't turn up or whatever to go to a different bus stand. It's not so easy to run across town to a completely different street. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. I did actually get really quite a lot of complaints, mainly from people with disabilities and possibly partly because of the, the point that John was making and the early signposting. And I want to thank um, uh, the WICA and the council officers who really jumped into that and, and tried to make things better and, and the signing better. I've also had um, quite a few people, I think as a result of the piece in the Courier, Halifax Courier, saying, what on earth was the matter with the old bus station? It's absolutely fine. You shouldn't spend any money on it. It will be fine for another 30 years. And um, we've just uh, completed some lengthy replies. But actually, I don't think people necessarily get the environmental issues in relation to this, the public safety issues in relation to the bus station, but also the fact that as a set of public organisations, we're investing for the future, not just next year or the year after, but actually for the longer term. So if there are opportunities to basically make sure that people understand this is an investment for the longer term. It's not about tweaking bits and pieces um, uh, just, just to sort of make things better is actually Although it's a bit of pain now, it is an investment for the longer term. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And uh, I fully agree with your comments in relation to all those benefits. But I think one of the other big benefits for me is that our bus station is a gateway into our town. And I don't think that the, the old bus station, to call it that, um, ever fully represented an appropriate gateway into the town. When you think of what some of the neighbouring towns have in terms of their bus stations, nice, welcoming environments, I think Halifax has always been um, quite cold. It's felt unmanned at night. It can sometimes feel a bit uh, scary and dark. And there's all these other matters which, um, beyond the obvious environmental and safety benefits, that I think in terms of how people feel when they go to use the bus or when they enter into our town, and I think that this station will make a massive change in terms of that and bring Halifax uh, up to the level where it should be, uh, especially in that corner of town where there's so much uh, exciting development going on uh, nearby and the council is looking to bring forward um, some exciting projects just next door um, where we already have the uh, the sixth form and as as I'm sure many people here will have noticed Halifax Town Centre is like a different place now it's filled with young people um, students having fun going and getting a coffee um, and it's creating a really positive dynamic in the town right next to this bus station so I think that this is a big part of um, transforming how Halifax is perceived by both its residents and people who come to visit. Um, if there's nothing further on that, then um, up next we've got operator updates. So, um, 
I'll come, come to where I can see. I'll come to you first, Alex. Do you, do you want to add anything? I know you've already given us a very... Uh, I think Chair very Jeff would have his hand up. Oh, did I'll, I'll stick with Alex and then I'll come to you, Jeff. Sorry. Okay. Thanks, Chair. I think I think just a general update. I mean, I mentioned about the, the, the driver shortage. I mean, that, that's the biggest issue, I suppose, facing industry at the moment. Um, I mean, we have, to put into context, though, we have 95 colleagues held up in the system somewhere, new people who we've recruited who are held up, either waiting for licences to be returned, tests to be organised. There are four different tests a bus driver has to do. Um, so from our point of view, we're not saying new people, you know, people don't want to be a bus driver. That that is the issue isn't as simple as that. There are there is there is there is a huge backlog in the DVLA and DVSA systems, which is causing us issues. Um I think um so I think that that's that's one thing to note. So I don't think we should necessarily get too downbeat or or indeed just blaming Brexit and COVID and saying, well, it's that fault, actually. I think, I think it is giving the bus industry, business, bus industry a bit of an opportunity to hold a mirror up to itself and say, how do we how do we continue to attract colleagues? Is it, and is it, I don't think it's just about pay as well. I think it's making sure we're giving people the right environment to work in, um, the right shifts to make sure we work around them where we can and so on. So I think, I think, I think the industry is, is, is going through some pain, but I think, I'd like to think we'll come out of it, come out of it a lot more positively because we learned a few lessons on the way. I think in terms of recovery as well, just to add, um, generally we're seeing around an 80%, 80% recovery of customers compared to 2019. That's the general transdev uh, flavour. But we run from 10 locations across the north of England, fairly tight together. So it gives you a sort of idea what's going on in the region as such. Um, and we reached quite a landmark moment on Sunday, albeit it's only a Sunday, where we reached, we were within 1% of our numbers of what we were carrying on the same Sunday in 2019. So I think that also gives you an indication that people are generally turning a bus for leisure and shopping and visiting family and discretionary journeys, and particularly for schools and things like that. I think I think we're the, the missing sort of 20 odd percent from our perspective is is around that that commuter traffic and work to, and, and trying to hopefully get out the people getting out of the system of of working from home and getting back into town centres, which which indeed would be good for Halifax and the other town centres around the area as well. So yeah, we, we see that as part of our of our problem though. If those customers aren't going to come back because there have been some structural changes in society, it's up to us to try and to try and attract other people to travel instead and, and carry on making sure that we can still provide as good as, if not better, a bus network than, than what was there before. And certainly that that's that's our aim. So so yeah, that's just to add to the um, countless of the minutes I've took of your time as well, but thank you for the opportunity of speaking. Thank you, Alex. Um, at the, before I bring in Jeff, at the last transport committee, we, we discussed a number of issues around around buses and, and how we uh, uh, work our way through the recovery. But one thing that came up very strongly was about people and about the fact that too often we talk about hard stuff like roads, like buses, but the system works based on people, and, and we need to be you know think about people a lot more in terms of what we do. Um, Jeff? Continue. Yeah, th thanks very much, Chair. Um, actually, fortuitously, kind of linked to some of the comments that um, Alex just made, um, <clears throat> just thinking about how we're going to reach non-bus users, because those are actually the people that we need to get out of their cars um, and onto the network. Uh, if we're going to get modal shift, we've actually got to reach people who aren't currently bus users. Um, maybe the you know the bus station perhaps might be an opportunity for us to um, you know to maximise the marketing, but I think it's 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 kind of an ongoing issue um, because the, there's a, there's a kind of a tribal approach to it. Either you're a car user or you're a bus user. Um, we need to find ways of coaching people, you know, coaxing people into the network Thanks, just, look at, just looking for co comments really Paul's put his hand up I'll come to you now Paul yeah I mean I think that's that's an entirely fair point um, we, we've done quite a bit over the last um, six months or so as, as restrictions started to be to be eased um, on a number of fronts um, one of which was to try and re-engage with those who hadn't travelled with us since, since last March. Um, so we, we gave everybody we had the details of in our app um, a free day ticket. Um, so that encouraged people to uh, go and try the bus, uh, see if they felt comfortable. Um, 
thankfully we had lots of lots of feedback lots of people were when you give them a free journey they like to tell you what they did with it um, which was really <laughs> interesting stuff so um whether it was a, a, a trip on the to the coast at scarborough or into your town for local shops and, and everybody generally fed back that they were happy they were they were pleasantly surprised by how clean things were and and how how safe it felt um, and, and that's always quite reassuring we've done other things with um we, we've got a, a one pound fair promotion on in the evening at the moment um throughout the north of england uh, and that's aiming to try and stimulate people traveling to to um hospitality stuff to help the um the, the hospitality industry recover um, and i think it, it's it's absolutely key that we we do engage on a wider basis so our operators and the combined authority have, have worked up the young person's um, fair deal. Um, so we've put in price reductions and simplicity of price ranges to, to encourage more young people to travel uh, on the basis they should be next year's, uh, or next year's the future long-term customers with us. Um, we've done um, plenty of other things along there. And I think with the BSIP coming along, the Bus Service Improvement Plan, there's a scope to sort of lock some of these in and say actually, um, and I think, I think perhaps sometimes the bus industry doesn't doesn't give itself credit for what it achieves in terms of customer growth because we we do turn over customers quite at a high rate. So if you think every year um, we lose twenty percent of school children because they leave school and we get another twenty percent in, people move house on average every seven or eight years. People change jobs periodically. So actually our customer, even if customer numbers are, are, are flat or slightly slightly rising or slightly declining, there's been a big churn in there. So we, we do successfully encourage attract new customers. The challenge we've got now is to do it in much bigger volumes and then also stop the churn out at the bottom. Um, and you can only do that by, by making, um, making things stable and, and, and high quality and reliable, which then gives you the platform on which to... Um, to invest in things and we've once we stabilize where we are in, in, in calderdale then we'll, we'll certainly have more actions to do that it's unfortunately for us at the moment it's not the right time as uh, mr shepherd mentioned about the, the 563 there's lots of potential to do things with that but only if we've we've got the basics right uh, so that's our focus at the moment but definitely yes the, there's opportunity to uh, to generate new customers and engage with uh, with, with non-users um, which is uh, is always challenging but we we've, we've done it successfully elsewhere I think, again, we look over in Harrogate where we run um, research tells us that over half our customers have have a car available for the journeys they choose to make with us. And that's always really reassuring when, when people are choosing to travel with you. So if we can get that, um, some of the experience from there and, and apply it over here, then we should have a, um, a heady, um, heady days in the future. Mm. Well, thank you for that. I mean, <clears throat> what I would say is that you know, we are in such a situation with the, the sort of you know, with climate change that the, there are such positive messages available to us. Um, and there are also other media that we can use, you know. Um, you know, this is a ro quite a romantic landscape and maybe, you know, the, the, the view you get from a bus might well be actually more attractive than the one you get from a car. Um, and especially if you're not if you're not driving, you can actually enjoy the landscape. There's, so maybe there are things that we could do collaboratively, using you know filmmakers, poets, writers, whatever, to to get to get a message across um, in a in a different way rather than just the hard marketing. If you see what I mean. <clears throat> I certainly do. I know we, as points there, we, we always specify our buses with double glazing. So though even on a misty day, you can see out the window, <laughs> little things like that apply. Yeah, we, we do engage with more creative marketing. Um, I'm sure if we had another hour on the meeting, Alex could give you a, a chapter and verse on that one, but perhaps another day. Perhaps we could persuade Sally Wainwright to write her next show about the buses on Calderdale and some sort of romance. That would add. That'd be transformative. Um, <laughs> start a petition for that one right okay um, I can realise I couldn't see everyone on my screen all at once so I've uh, I've looked Will uh, Will are you wanting to give an update do you have one 
Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Will Pearson, Head of Operations for First West Yorkshire. Um, so <laughs> I, I, I want to start where Alex finished, really, and that's thank everyone. Um, uh, and by everyone, I mean our customers and, and users um, for the disruption that they faced in recent times. It's been such a challenging uh, period for the bus industry. It's it's off the scale. I've been around for an awful long time, at least around the industry, and I've never seen a time like it. Um, so, and then I can thank Paul and Alex for basically stealing all my thunder for the challenges that the industry faces because they're exactly the same. Um, other than Alex's new business, um, the, the core and at the heart of what we do is essentially the same. And what is pleasing to hear is that joined up alliance approach to what we're about to do going forwards into 2022 and beyond. It's so important to us um, in first that we do all work together and, and the, the non-confrontational language around not overlaying the network with simply more buses and actually working together in partnership makes complete sense for the customer. And it means the customer offering ends up being a better offering than, than they could have had before. Um, so if I will um, take up a few moments of your time to just go through some of the points that... Um, that I have written down, so I don't want to waste my time. <laughs> so Halifax bus station, um, a few bumpy uh, moments at the beginning, but we're operating in and out of there absolutely fine. And uh, I echo others' comments around how, how much we're looking forward to seeing it completed. It'll make a real difference to the, the offer and, and, and just, just, just shine that corner of um, Halifax Town. It really will make all the difference. When we think about our patronage numbers across West Yorkshire, we are peaking at around 74% uh, of the numbers from last week. Um, Halifax itself was in the region of 70% of our 2019 numbers. So it's building. Um, in the summer, we were at 45, 50%. So it's, it's building slowly and we do expect that um, build to continue. The key challenge is and continues to be around that driver resource that Alex and, uh, and others have mentioned. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you're all aware um, that it's industry-wide. Some, strangely enough, that thought it would be interesting to go try something else have started to show an interest in returning to us. So that's, that, that's good to see because I, I always had the sense that we would have some uh, that would think the grass was greener, to quote the phrase, um, but when they realise that 150 multi-drops a day over 12 to 14 hours running around towns and cities is probably not as fun as they thought it was when they left. Uh, and equally, when you're stuck a couple of hundred miles away from home um, in an Arctic wagon, um, we, we, we're seeing some people showing interest in returning to us. So we will welcome those back. Um, Alex mentioned license acquisition, and that's been a real problem for, for us. It's taken up to 12 weeks um, just to get the licenses processed in some cases. It's now improving, and we're getting some back after three or four weeks. So hopefully within, within a little while, the DVLA will be in a position where they're processing them in the standard two weeks. Um, because for those of you that know or don't know, um, typical um, bus driver training and um, job application from start to finish. So, so showing an interest to going solo on the road can take up to three months normally. So you can see that a, a, a delay of getting the license processed just extends that and makes it harder for all of us. We do have a solid pipeline. So as Alex said, there's, there's people that want to be bus drivers, um, but we need to get them into the system and get them through the sausage machine, spat out, get them with uh, depots, get them with train um, trainers, and mentors and get them on the road and serving the customer. How do we manage all that? Well, as we've done elsewhere, we, we are constant, constantly reviewing our um, network to see what we can do to sensibly and demand-led, so looking at the data, um, improve or support the service delivery. Um, and that could include timetable changes. And we, we, we need to do what? Um, what is best for the customer in terms of reliability because it's, it's okay promising one thing and then not delivering because you're X amount of drivers short and we can't continue um, like that. But we do have that plan um, to put my, any mileage that comes out goes back in and, and that will be done strategically and sensibly over time. And we are confident that within three, three or four months, 
just like Transdev, I guess um, the numbers of drivers will be back in a position where we can deliver um, again. So changing topic slightly, um, divisionally, we're actually trialing a um, an additional piece of functionality to our customer app. And that's in relation to cancellations, meaning that when a trip is unfortunately lost, um, we can, in the back office, cancel that trip and it will then show for the customer. So the customer will see that something is missing. The customer will not go out there for the bus that does not then turn up, um, which is just another piece of additional um, tech support that, that we're looking forward to seeing being rolled out down in the south and we'll be um, seeing when that comes into West Yorkshire and we'll share the comms um, with customers as and when required. Um, just on Paul's point about trying to improve the uh, the leisure market, uh, we are also running a one pound evening fair uh, to try and encourage uh, people to travel. Um, it, it's such a great move. I, I, I think it's exactly the right kind of um, measure that we need to put in place to attract people into the leisure markets because, as we know, um, it's becoming, whilst people are working from home, they want to get out. And because they want to get out, what do they want to do? They want to get into the cities, to the bars, to the restaurants, and hopefully um, start spending some money in the towns and cities across across the region. So um, we're, we're fully, fully supportive of... Um, of that and we're, we're pushing that message and that in a nutshell is uh, the first update thank you will well, thank you a little bit very interesting i'm interested to see when the uh, the functionality of the app makes its way up from the south everything seems to have to take its way up from the south doesn't it and uh, maybe one day it'll go in the other direction probably more uh, midlands and eastern counties if i'm honest all right okay still all, all south towards northern as well right no. um i'll come to you john um, great first for admitting that buses are missing. It must be really embarrassing for you to have on the Hatfield bus station uh, three or four or five buses cancelled, but it is great for the passenger to know that the bus is cancelled and to know what to do about that and either to get another bus to somewhere near or to change or to go away and do something interesting in the meantime much, much better than waiting and waiting and waiting and hoping and, and it never happens. Absolutely. But thank you for putting those cancellations up. That's a great move at last. Thank you for the feedback. Thank you, John. Um, if there's nothing else, I'm going to come to you then, Pete, to give the uh, Northern update. Gladly. Um, we haven't got a driver shortage, you'll be pleased to know. I think we pay them too much, but uh, there we go. Uh, we have got issues, though, and I'll go through them now. Performance generally is good and remains strong. We're, we measure something we call time to three, uh, which is basically three minutes, within three minutes, at every uh, station upon on the routes. And we are hitting a figure of about 88% to that now, which if you equate to the old uh, passenger performance measure, PPM, it would be in the 90s, so that's good. Admittedly, we're not running as many trains, although we're not far off a full timetable, and, and clearly in some cases we've got fewer people on board. And if I jump to customer numbers now, encouraging really here in the north, because our, our customer numbers are in the mid 70% of what they were pre-COVID, and actually this week has shown a slight upturn um, the actual revenue figure is even higher than that. And, and the reason for that is uh, most of those figures are from people making leisure journeys. And we've seen a huge upturn this summer in, uh, well, this year in leisure journeys. And indeed, many often on the weekends, especially when the weather's like nice, as it was last weekend, those figures are well above those we would have seen pre-COVID. The commute, on the other hand, is not what it was, and our commute remains in the 30% of, of its pre-COVID numbers, and uh, it, it is showing a slight increase, a, a slight improvement, uh, but it's not massively, uh, it's still, it's still sub-40%, which is an issue for us. And to help uh, address that issue, we are, we are marketing uh, commuter travel very heavily at the moment and we'll continue to do that that's something we never needed to do in the past of course 
Uh, one product that we have, it's a national product, but it uh, it was pioneered here in, the, in, in West Yorkshire, is the flexible season ticket. This is almost a Carnet product and that allows people to travel uh, multiple journeys for, for the price of fewer. Uh, take up is is low on it, but it would be with a commute level of thirty percent. But generally, that's what we've got. We've got to make these products attractive to people whose uh, whose working patterns will change. Uh, we, with one thing we're clearly seeing is Mondays and Fridays are much quieter than Tuesdays, Wednesdays, or Thursdays because people, if they are working at home, are linking it to a weekend, which is, uh, I guess, not surprising. Um, so that's passenger numbers. Uh, COVID-19, how's that affected us and how does it continue to affect us? Well, in two ways. One, uh, both of them, uh, are f- I can, I can, there is certainly light at the end of the tunnel uh, and uh, it'll soon be with us too. We are, the first problem is something we call COVID allowances. And this is simply extra time built into the rosters of our, our people so they don't all book on at the same time. Uh, and so we don't get crowding around depots. That goes away in May next year and for the main tide table, or, or providing the R rate stays where it, sh- it should do. And that's really encouraging. But the big problem uh, was all of last year, for most of last year, we didn't train any train drivers. Now, for a train operator that trains more train drivers than any other, because because we have so many of them, this was a real issue. We. we We quickly got the classrooms up and running again, uh, as you would expect, because we could socially distance there and that worked. But in any driver's training, there comes a point when they have actually got a driver train and we generally don't let them do that unsupervised. So um, what we what we do, they go in with a a mentor or or minder, as we call them. But it was it is impossible to socially distance in a driving cab. So for a long time, there was no training taking place. Great work by the trades unions and our people early at the, at the turn of the year meant that training was introduced and these people were all volunteers and they were all testing twice a day and all sorts of stuff. But it worked and the training started and we got all our new trains training done during that period, which was a huge hump for us, especially in West Yorkshire and very important to the Calder Dale line because of, uh, of all the new trains that run up there. That's now dealt with and the training now is for new people basically and uh, thankfully uh, a couple of weeks ago a lot of the restrictions again with work with the trades unions they were lifted and now training is pretty much as it was pre-covid and we're certainly making hay while the sun shines and we're training a lot of people and by about uh, by about well, certainly April next year, we should be through the, the rump of this and we should be business as usual as far as train crew training goes. The fuel shortage was much talked about and, and, and that's something we seem to have, have got better in the north than, than south. But um, we didn't have an issue with, with fuel for, for trains because most of that's delivered by rail uh, and that, that isn't, is through a separate contract which wasn't affected. Uh, but we did see it with our cleaning teams for the stations who were filling up their vans at petrol stations. That now seems to have gone away and we seem a lot better than we were. So that's good news. Um, Neville Hill Depot, uh, very important to Calderdale because mo- most of the trains you see have, uh, spend some part of the day or, or night in Neville Hill. That is uh, currently or was always shared between us and East Midlands Railway always a bit strange because they had bases derby but it is what it was and it made it less efficient well it's all coming to us now and we're doing a lot of road shows with those people who are transferring over to work with northern and work for northern and initially there will be very little change but in the medium terms this gives us lots of opportunities to improve both employment for for young people and and local people, but also our service, because when Neville Hill sneezes, basically West Yorkshire catches a cold. So we really have to get that depot right. So this is encouraging news and and the transfer happens next Monday. So that's good news. December uh, 21 timetable is shortly to, well, it has been announced for us, very few differences, but for Calderdale there are because the Halifax whole services go return to hourly. They were, they, for the summer, they have been uh, every two hour, 
to allow us to run more trains along leisure routes. They go back hourly in December, which is good. Um, there is a new community rail partnership funding now, part funded by our friends from Calderdale Council and Rochdale Council for the, um, for the Calderdale line. And we'll certainly work uh, with that for the Calder Valley line. We'll certainly work with that to make sure we play our part to make that a success. And it has every opportunity of really lifting our line uh, and making a difference for us. We're working on Halifax Station as uh, as we uh, as we speak. Constant talks about the detail of what the new uh, station gateway will look like, and it's really really encouraging. We're arguing about where the loos will go at the moment. So once you get to that level, you know it's it's getting near to fruition. And and I do really feel quite quite excited about that because Halifax Station lets the town. Well, it's, it's not the gateway to the town we'd want it to be. So. That work carries on. My then ride, our car park is finished and uh, very impressive. And the work we're doing to extend Hebden Bridge is underway now and that work has started. So that's good news there. And lastly, um, lots of work on marketing to encourage people to the train. Uh, we, we had a flash sale where we were selling uh, tickets for a pound uh, Earlier on, that was a great success. Lots of people took advantage of that, as you would expect them to do. And that encourages people back to the railway, which is what we're about now, because even at 80%, that's not 100%. And we do need to get those people traveling again. Um, one thing that probably discourages people from traveling is the mask compliance issue. And this I know was controversial yesterday at the Leeds session. They aren't mandated on public transport um, in, in England. Subsequently, um, we can't insist on it. We advise people to wear them. We ask people to wear them. But if they don't, they don't. And, of course, some people can't wear them. Uh, but it is an issue, and I know that came up uh, in Leeds yesterday. Uh, Chair, apart from that, that's everything from me. Thank you, Pete. A full update, as always. Though I've noticed that we've lost Dave and Ben. So um, and I'm not sure if Ben was taking the minutes or that was you earlier. Um, so I don't know what's happened with them. Yeah, it was sorry, it was Ben, but I can take over. They might have lost connection. They're in the offices and the connection's not very good there, so I'll keep an eye. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, and thank you for raising the, the community rail partnership for uh, for the Calder Valley line. I think that will be uh, something quite interesting and a really good way to engage the wider community into, into rail matters and perhaps pull together some of that romantic vision that Jeff was referencing earlier in terms of a trip down the Calder Valley line for a day. And, I, you know, I find, you know, the towns on the Calder Valley line are quite wonderful to go and visit. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, we'll encourage much more of that uh, for whatever purpose. Um, now, next on the agenda, we had... Um, a workshop workshop session. I think that Dave was going on um, on travel and transport priorities post um, post pandemic. Our oh, Dave has returned. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Yeah, so parties, we, we we seem to have a uh, um, in this office um, a, a sort of outage of the of the internet so uh, that might mean Ben's not on the line either so, um, so you'll just, just need to, to bear with us a, a touch but what, what I wanted to do was um, was to um, was to, to talk you through a presentation um, which if you just bear with me um, I'll need to transfer from one computer to another um, uh, to uh, to do that um, uh, Fine, Dave. Got, got Alex, Alex, you do that. Uh, Alex has got his hand up. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, chair. Just to just to sort of ask your permission to leave, if that's okay. I've got a half yeah. three. But thank, thanks for um, thanks for the support and understanding. And yeah, and look forward to to the next one. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, Cheers. Bye bye. Appreciate some of the people might have places they need to get to. Uh, Dave's got a presentation, and I'm sure that'll generate some discussion. But uh, I think inevitably, 
quite a bit of the discussion throughout the meeting has been around the recovery, uh, the ongoing recovery um, across both bus and, bus and rail. Um, and I think we've, hopefully, you know, from each operator, I think they've, they've laid out a very good roadmap of, of what the future and what the next few months will look like in terms of that recovery and, you know, all being well across the board. Uh, by spring, we should be uh, in a situation where most of these issues have been have been resolved, and um, we're running in the sort of the sort of network that we'd be hoping to run. I'll invite Dave to start as and when he's ready. You're okay, Dave. Don't feel pressured. Sorry, what I wanted to do was to um, to to basically have a, some of the discussion we've already been having um, around the, um, the, the, the effect of the pandemic on, on travel patterns and on how people are, are traveling with Sorry, around. Um, I'll interject. Very hard to hear you. So, uh, um, the, uh, what we what what we we got which our actual email to you and apology. I can't get it on the screen because I've, I've joined on using Dave. I'm just going to interrupt my mobile phone. I think we're very much. I think we're very much struggling. Okay, sorry. Uh, I, did, did you? Were you, were you saying that you were going to email? Email now. I, I think if if you if you're having connection issues, perhaps it's best if you email the presentation out and people can. Uh, respond with the no, feedback. Mail it to people have to again. Hello. <laughs> Is everyone here happy with that as a way forward if they're struggling to connect? All right. Yeah. No, I'll try and ask him to do that. All I was going to say on the topic, well, and a few people have raised it, was the point around leisure use um, and around the exciting opportunities that are there in terms of reshaping the network, um, whether it's a daytime trip out to the countryside or people going out for a bottle of wine and a meal on an evening and choosing to get what is a much more cost-effective option, which is a bus rather than, than a taxi, but it seems to be the default So for so many um, and I think there is going to be a restructure because I don't think commuting is going to return to what it was before. Um, I think a lot of businesses are going to think twice about sending people to uh, meetings all over the all over the region um, when some of them can be more effectively done done online. Um, not all, not all. I think there's definitely a lot of space for in-person meetings and I, and I miss them in the uh, situations where we can't have them um, but I think there's a lot of opportunities uh, for people to perhaps just live better lives, live more efficiently. Um, I've travelled, I've taken longer to travel to places than the meetings taken at points. And that's not a criticism of the, the speed of the network, it's just the reality of sometimes what you do. Myra? Yeah, just further to that, um, wouldn't it be nice if out of that we got better Sunday services on both buses and trains? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And, be and better evening services. People going yeah. to things in the evenings can't get a bus back. It's no wonder they take a taxi. Could I make a comment? Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah. yeah um, one of the things that you know we need to perhaps acknowledge, and maybe um, operators already do, is that the drivers are are sort of ambassadors, and. I don't know whether this is acknowledged in, in tra driver training. Um, the, the kind of reaction that, that, um, that passengers get from a driver is, is that very much influences your perception of, of the journey and of the sense of you know, whether you're there as a, as a customer who is welcome or whether you're there as a, 
a bit of a hindrance to keeping the timetable running. Um, and I, I just, what I did at one stage try and get an insight into um, first driver training program, but I never managed to get to attend. It just didn't happen. I don't quite sure why, but I just think it's, you know, you've, you've stressed elsewhere in this meeting the importance of people. And, and that's incredibly important. Uh, but it, it, it's about everybody. The drivers are people too. Anyway, I'm getting some very some interference on, the, on this, so I'm just going to end there. Thanks. I'll uh, I'll come to Paul and then I'll, I'll come to you, Will, if you if you've got yeah. your hand. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just to pick up on on those comments. Um, Driver training wise, we've we've done some work as the the alliance to to basically where we, we we share best practice in there. But some of the things hopefully you'll see develop at Team Pennine as we we continue to roll out our, our standards are um, better driver engagement with customers. So we have um, sort of quite a lot in our training school about this. So always making sure you you, you give people the right um, or necessarily give them the best the best ticket for their uh, their journey. Um, you uh, you greet them as the board. Um, you make sure they get a chance to sit down. Um, from a leisure point of view, actually, we we have a, a, a scheme which is called Transdev Treats around the north, whereby we've got some um, partnerships with uh, attractions. So the driver, when you if you're getting off the bus, um, just an example, say Harewood House in Leeds, um, they'll print off a voucher from the ticket machine and give it to you, and you can go and get um, a couple of pound off your your entrance fee. Um, so that's part of our, our, our plan for around here as well. Um, when our new buses arrive, uh, finally, um, in a couple of weeks, um, each of those will have um, messages inside um, detailing some of the attractions you can see around Coldale um, that we serve to, to encourage people to make those journeys. So it, it's all um, lots of things happening. Um, you're absolutely right. It, it is the people um, that, that make this happen. Um, we're actually only here, we only exist as an industry because people need to move. Um, and we we, uh, we have also a very people intensive business because we need lots of people to be other people. So getting that that investment in, in those those individuals in their, their customer um, care skills, uh, generally speaking as well, it's easier to turn a customer focused, friendly person into a bus driver. Um, than it is a, a bus driver who's not customer focused into a customer focused one, um, which is why in normal times our, our preference is to recruit fresh into the industry. Um, and uh, we, we, I think we're being honest, we're perhaps slightly less choosy at the moment um, than, we, than we, we normally are because uh, we, we need people. Um, but yeah, our focus really is on, on getting that getting that quality through uh, and and. We, we've turned the the, the, the the regular training sessions that drivers have the CPC um, into a, a particular focus on the customer to make sure uh, that that message is out there. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think I, in some way, I probably agree with all you said, Jeff. <laughs> That's a long-winded <laughs> way of saying, saying I agree. There we are. Thank you. Thanks. And I think they're recruiting, Jeff, if you're looking to go through the training. <laughs> <laughs> That's one way. Um, I'll, I'll come to you, Will, and then I'm going to... Yeah, I, I will take a moment. Um, I can echo everything that Paul has just said there. Um, uh, as I said earlier, the industry is the industry, and, and we recruit customer-facing um, people. Um, we have got to remember the, the people are at the core of everything that that we do and deliver and how we deal with the customer. And that customer training does continue throughout a driver's career now. Once upon a time, it didn't. But the driver CPC training does cover that. And we have something to call a Journey Makers Champion training courses. They are continuing. And each year, as part of that CPC, we change slightly the customer impact that we're covering that specific year so every year a driver gets a different view as to which element we're covering um and sometimes that's in inwards as in the drivers so for example journey maker six will cover some some of the mental health issues that we see out and about on 
in, in, in society, but also looking at their own personal health and well-being, which is an important factor, isn't it? Because we want our people to be fit, health, healthy mm-hmm. and well to be able to then deliver a good service. Because if they're feeling under the weather and they're not 100 percent, they're not going to do that. And then we've done everything from equalities and um, other o- other elements that it, it, it's potentially jeff i might reach out to you and just get one of my training managers to uh, maybe run through what a typical driver is is taught if that sounds um, yeah, yeah absolutely fine yeah okay, I'd, I'd welcome it all right cool I'll, I'll i'll make some arrangements thank you okay thank you for that will and uh thank you everybody for a, a good and positive meeting it's definitely been very informative um definitely uh, very positive as well in terms of where the future might be, um, even if we've got definitely a few challenges at the moment, uh, but understandably, I think a few challenges at the moment. Um, but hopefully, if all that's been said is pulled off, we should be uh, looking at a much more resilient network into the future. Um, as Dave's been having connection problems, if Dave could send out by email his presentation, and then if anybody wants to feedback, um, you can comment back on email and perhaps it's well I think it's likely to be a topic that we may well discuss a future meeting as well um, is that alright you Dave? Yep okay alright very good alright well thank you everyone for attending and I uh, yes, look we'll, forward to seeing we'll, you all we'll, we'll do that I don't know whether you can hear me because uh, um, um, uh, we've got a lot of problems at this end but yes we'll do that alright I did get that bit Dave alright thanks nice to see everybody Take care. Thank you, Dan.